I'd like to confirm uh, the kind of relationship you have now with the president. Uh, president Babangida is a friend. Just look at the house, take a snapshot of all the pictures in the house. You will find more of his pictures in my house than my own pictures. We've been friends for over 20 years. Very, very, very close friends. Um, Shortly after the annulment of Nigeria's June 12, 1993 elections, won by businessman Chief MKO Abiola, an interview was conducted at his home in Lagos. Chief Abiola was flanked by numerous student activists, including the then 22-year-old president of the University of Lagos's student union, one Omoyele Shoore. Omoyele and his cohort had led numerous protests against the military dictatorship of General Babangida and were invited by Chief Abiola after protests against the recent annulment of elections. Soon after this, MKO Abiola was arrested. And within five years, he and his wife Kudirat would be killed. Months later, the interim president, Ernest Shonekon, would be ousted by his Minister of Defense, General Sani Abacha. And as he did with Babangida, Omoyele would go on to challenge his dictatorship. Little did either of these men know that just over 25 years later, Omoyele himself would run for president of Nigeria. But where did it all begin? to Ondo State, where Omoyele hails from. I need to know more about the man and the circumstances which shaped his upbringing. Some 600 kilometers from the city of Abuja lies the village of Kirigbo, where Omoyele's formative years were spent in the 1970s. Omoyele isn't allowed to leave Abuja, so I'm joined by his younger brother. Whilst Omoyele had been in custody, the women of his village had advocated for his release. I was eager to meet them upon our arrival, and after a 12-hour journey, I finally did. They walked me to a nearby stream where Moyele spent a lot of his afternoon swimming. Funny, we learn how to swim the day we were born in my own part of the world. Uh, I think after seven days, you're thrown into the lake and um, reportedly to test the paternity of the child. So if you floated, you are your father's son or daughter. If you go to the bottom, too bad. Uh, you never, I mean, no child ever drowned from that, but uh, that's how we start. It's, uh, it's, yeah, you can tell that I floated, of course, uh, the son of my dad. But 
The most exciting part about swimming is when you combine swimming with fishing. There's some kind of uh, fish that live inside some rocks in, uh, in the lake. They have to actually, you know, go down there and, you know, drag them out of uh, the crevices of the rocks. And on one occasion, there was a particular one that was stuck there and I wouldn't want it to go. So, you know, I almost drowned, just trying to get this fish to come with me. Well, it's a very stubborn fish. Um, otherwise, we just, we just swam for the fun of it. And I later found out that it was the reason why most of the people in our part of the world were equally physically fit. Swimming makes you very, very fit. And we swam a lot. As the sun is setting, we head back to shore. Omoyele's younger brother still lives here. He and I took a walk through the town before retiring for the night. How many people do you think are related to Shuara's family? Because they say his dad had 20-something children. Yeah, at least. A, a part of a quarter in this town is related huh? to Shuara. Because of because of the dad side, a part of a quarter, uh, almost a quarter uh, in this town. Because we have like nine quarters in this town: Ejakama, uh, Dumunduko, and Zion, Kibugalafia, Polubene, Madagbayu, Udumado. So his own main quarter is from Udumado, and nearly everybody is related in that quarter. And how is your own relationship to him? Uh, I'm sure we're his brother. This same dad, yeah, same father, different mother, same mother. Okay, same mother. Eh? Are you serious? I didn't even know. Eh? And they are, so that means you have twenty-five siblings originally. No, we are sixteen. Sixteen. Okay, sixteen siblings. Okay. The whole, the whole setting. Mm -hmm. sixteen. Three wives. One man. Early the next morning, we set out. My first stop was a mere few minutes away. Kiribo School is where a young Omoyele was educated before leaving for Lagos to attend university. So my father was like very involved in my course of study, like choice of. But he wasn't interested in me going to the University of Lagos, so he hated Lagos. It's just like Lagos is meant for people who lie and they're rascals, and you know. Because when Lagos people come home for Christmas or New Year, they come with all these nice clothes. We'll find out later that they borrow them. And when they get back to Lagos, they return them. So people in the village just don't trust Lagos people. And my dad is like, you know, you got to go to school. So, so I wrote Jam twice. First, uh, I was supposed to do the jam in 1988. I did jam in 1988, jam being the admission exam for Nigeria. And, but I broke my leg uh, playing soccer, so I couldn't prepare properly. So I chose uh, business administration that time. And you know, my scores weren't that bad, but I didn't make the cutoff. So as I was going around at the University of Lagos, someone suggested that geography and planning might accept me. We went several times, met a lot of uh, university professors, admission officers, and I didn't make it. So when I went back in, 
for the 1989 admission circle year, I just chose geography and planning. University of Lagos, first choice. University of Illinois was my second choice. I, don't, I think it was Undo State University that was my third choice. I don't remember exactly now. So, and I, I was admitted straight in 1989. You know, I made a cutoff and I was admitted on merit. When Omoyele enrolled at the University of Lagos in 1989, Lagos was the capital of Nigeria and was where the military head of state, General Ibrahim Babangida, resided. Naturally, the University of Lagos, like many other schools across Nigeria, was a haven for anti-military activists and the pro-military cultist groups. Omoyele quickly took to the former and began to experience the cost of speaking out. In 1992, we had a major protest, you know, which they call riots in Nigeria, across Nigeria, and was uh, what was uh, the Babangida Moscow protest. Babangida, uh, General Ibrahim Babangida was the head of state at that time. And we were arrested and beaten, like, the world was coming to an end and detained at the police station on Western Avenue in Lagos. And at four o'clock, the, we were detained, we were kept in a cell and they threw a tear gas canister into the cell and we passed out. It was pretty bad. And when we woke up, we now started calling the show, each of us and said, we should sign a document that we are planning to overthrow the government. It was the first time I was accused of planning to overthrow the government. I was telling them, why, why do you think I will overthrow the government with just carrying placards and leaves? It was a protest. To me, it was something that was crazy to be accused of planning to overthrow the government. Why would I want to overthrow the government? It's a protest. We're asking for democracy. How could that mean? We are pro-democracy activists. And the beating continued. Anyway, at about 5 p.m., they released all of us, just came and opened the cell, so yeah, they go. I asked, why, why did you release us now? They said, well, the U.S. Embassy had condemned the climb down students. And during that protest, they killed over seven people or so uh, in, in the protest. They opened fire, but they injured a number of students. Uh, subsequently, I participated in protests where they shot people beside me. Uh, shot some students in one of the protests on campus. At that time, I had become the student union president. Our next destination was a small town, also in Undo State. We were on our way to visit the two people who closely witnessed Omoyele's coming of age. Olakbeju Emeinola is Omoyele's sister. She lives at this house with their mother, Mrs. Esther Kende Showare. Since they have arrested my son, I am not okay. I am always afraid. And it affected my head. I cannot eat well or sleep well. So look at my the medicine I'm using. So now, if you see me walking, I'm walking like 105 years old. That is why I cannot go and see my son in Abuja. I was unable to travel to far place. What was he like when he was growing up? What kind of a boy was he when he was growing up? My son is a man of God. He always fighting for freedom. Freedom of the family and freedom of Nigeria. And I don't know that if somebody is fighting for freedom, it can bring another problem. Or they can punish the, the pers particular person like this. I don't know. When, when, when he was a small boy, was he very... I mean, what kind of things did he like to do when he was small? Was he sports? Mm. Or what, what was he doing? 
He always fighting for freedom since, since even before he went to Lagos to the university. He always fighting. Omohile's mother may not be able to visit her son in Abuja, but this is certainly not the first time she's experienced her son in the custody of Nigeria's state security services. So after the 1992 major protests of, you know, one of, I was one of the protest leaders, I was arrested, beaten up, accused of planning to overthrow the government, released that same day, then expelled a few days later. They sent the expulsion letter to my village. Don't forget that it took six months for letters to get there, naturally, but it got there the same day. Went to my dad. My dad called a village meeting, um, saying, look, because the expulsion letter was explicit, that apart from being expelled from the University of Lagos, no university in Nigeria would ever accept me. So not only am I expelled from the University of Lagos, Shinin Lagos, it used to be called, I'm expelled from any opportunity to go to a higher institution in Nigeria, any tertiary institution in Nigeria. We went to court. We tried to get a court order to reverse that process. We had a judge who was a very, very pro-government, rapidly pro-government judge. I think his name was Abiodun Kashinten, Joseph Abiodun Kashinten. He's late now. So he didn't, uh, he didn't give us an order. So when they reopened the school, we just came, engaged in protests, lecture boycotts. The next day, all of us were reabsorbed back into campus. I asked Olak Beju to join us and talk to me about her memories of the numerous arrests which befell her older brother over the past three decades. This uh, first arrest they gave to him when he was a Unilag student. I was aware of it, I was there. It was my present that day in Unilag. You were there in Unilag? Yeah, I was there in Unilag with Dabsen and the friends Aguru and the rest. So I was in school that very day that they wounded him with the court members. So I was the one that even went to loot, that presented my ID card when I was in Adeyemi then. So we were together. So it was my present. Without any lag uh, issue that uh, court, court members, it was my present then. And what, what did you do immediately after you saw them carrying him away? What did, what did you do? I quickly came down home to at least to tell my dad and my mom. Immediately I told my mommy, my mommy fainted. So I came together with my dad, we went down to Lagos. So before everything, you know, we, later we'll not tell my mom what is happening. Myself and my dad will just be going up and down, we want to tell my mom. So, and during the time they arrested him, and they said, Panty, I was the one going there, cooking for him. I was then staying at Maza Maza. I will go and cook for him, he come back again during that time. There was during that era of uh, era of Operation Sweep. But we went to Ijibu. That was where we made the case that day. So I was with him then. 1994, uh, the, the school authorities and the government organized and got me attacked on campus. I was almost killed. And uh, they expelled me after that. That was my second expulsion. So when they reopened the school again, we came back forth. They reabsorbed, reabsorbed us back into the system. And uh, 1995, okay, I wrote my final exams towards the end of 1994. 1995, as soon as the students left, they just withheld my results. And I, asked, I went to school asking them what they all said, I have to face some disciplinary action. I went to see the student union, uh, stu the student affairs office. They had like seven expulsion letters, warnings, all kinds of letters there for me. They were never even delivered to me. So, 1995, they brought a new vice chancellor. He just from nowhere invited us to campus and said, I don't want to deal with you guys. Uh, as they say in Nigeria, come and we're going. So that was how I went to NYC. I went to do my National Youth Service Corps, which is a compulsory youth service uh, in Nigeria. 
And uh, I was sent to Yola in Adamawa State. The day I was supposed to finish NYC, I was actually part of the people that did the personal parade. I was waiting to collect my NYC certificate. The DSS came and arrested me, detained me for like a week, transferred me to the Air Force base. They put me in a guard room and detained me for a week and denied me my NYC certificate. So everywhere they could relay me, they did, up to today. So when I was done with NYC, I went back to doing pro-democracy work. 97, 98, one day suddenly, I think 98, Abacha just suddenly died like that and we were all jubilating. For some reason, they refused to release Abiola a month after Abiola too died. And in 1999, I just packed my bags and left Nigeria. And when he decided that he was going to go to America, were you happy or were you? In fact, the two of you, were you happy? Were when you? he wanted to go to America, I was so happy that at least, you know, Nigeria doesn't want truth. They don't want you to tell the truth. And if you want to say the truth, they eliminate you. So today, oh, it's a Higbe case. Tomorrow, another person case, you know? And if my daddy talked to himself, Daddy, Mom, just pray for me. This is what I want to do. Pray. If you, he said, you, if you have wish, use that your wish to pray for me. Because at times I would not be happy because I know what Nigeria is. They don't want truth. After the mysterious death of President Sani Abacha in 1998, an interim government was formed by his chief of defense staff, General Abdul Salam Abubakar. MKO Abiola died shortly before his supposed release, and elections were called for 1999. A newer constitution had been formed at the hands of the military, and two parties emerged as frontrunners. The People's Democratic Party candidate, Olu Shegun Obasanjo, recently released from prison, was a former army officer who had served as head of state from 1976 to 1979. His presidency would signify Nigeria's return to a form of civilian rule. But many things stayed the same. When I looked at the horizon, I just saw no hope of a better Nigeria, we kind of candidates that emerged, you know. When I was, um, Obasanjo was the candidate of the PDP, and Ulufalai, who actually had introduced a uh, structural adjustment program when he was Minister of Finance under, under Babagida. And I said to myself, this is the time to leave. I was also getting very sick. And I had a whole history of what happened to me in the university. And I wanted to get tested and get treated. So I traveled first to a conference at the American University in Washington, D.C. and had planned to come back in two weeks. While I got there, uh, I was advised by the people treating me to stay a little longer, and uh, so I applied for an extension of my visa. The visa I was granted. And subsequently, two weeks became 20 years in the U.S. Omoyele went back to school receiving a master's degree from Columbia University. He eventually settled down and started a family with his wife, Okbayemi. Watching from afar, as his beloved Nigeria descended into anarchy, corruption, and impunity under Obasanjo. Maybe between 2004 and 6, I worked with the Catholic Charities as a refugee resettlement manager. And I knew, you know, the workplace wasn't anything. In fact, it was that job that made me to become very angry about the situation of not Nigeria alone at that time, but Africa, because we were receiving refugees from Liberia, Syria, or Somalia, you know, different kinds of African uh, states that were either experiencing conflict or war, so economic adversity. So I said to myself, 
time to do something different and that was what led me to start Sahara Reporters. I did Sahara Reporters for, you know, it's for a good 10 years. You know, I did a lot of exposures, man. We wrote a lot of stories. We expanded, became a full spectrum multimedia company. And I got to a point where I just know that Nigerian politicians have become immune to ordinary reports. At the beginning, you know, it was hitting them really hard, you know. But after a while, you know, <laughs> I just feel like the public had become sensitized to the fact that it would be another big story from Sahara Reporter. Then after that, it says, so what? The country wasn't improving in any way, and I started to think about taking the ministry in a different direction, which is political. It was a hard decision to make, considering that I knew that they had bastardized politics to the point that, you know, there's no entry point that was safe. If you solve Nigeria's problem, myriads of political, social, and cultural problems, it will just infect the rest of Africa almost instantly. And this is what I think the rest of the world doesn't understand about Nigeria. In 2018, Omoyele began campaigning to be president of Nigeria. Focusing at first on the diaspora, he held a town hall meetings across Europe, North America, and other parts of the continent. His movement, known as Take It Back, gathered steam and presented Nigerians with new and innovative ideas that could move the country forward. His campaign raised over 100 million naira transparently, and Omoyele was the only candidate to visit nearly all of Nigeria's 36 states. Between he and other younger candidates, it felt as though Nigeria could be set for a change. The establishment banned him from attending some debates. They copied his policy ideas and restricted his movements. With no chance of a coalition with the other progressive leaders, Omoyele formed the African Action Congress Party. When it was all over, President Buhari remained president and his counterpart in the PDP, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar, was the runner-up. Perhaps fearing the impact he might have on Nigeria's political scene, Omoyele soon began experiencing issues with his political party. Soon after, revolution now was started and Omoyele was arrested. A campaign was launched by Omoyele supporters lobbying for his release. It began with his wife, then senior advocates of Nigeria's legal arena and even a U.S. senator. Omoyele is yet to be reunited with his wife and children in America after nearly two years of restrictions in Abuja. He's continued to protest. He's been rearrested and even shot at at close range by Abuja police. What's that been like for you mentally? You know, I'm, I'm mentally okay. You know, I always wanted to be here in Nigeria. And uh, so that's been enforced by a court order now. <laughs> but um, I think it's part of uh, what must happen on our way to freedom. They are not interested in a trial, they are just persecution and harassment. Their intention is to see if they can cow me. Ultimately, they might do something, but I don't care. And you specifically, what do you think will happen to you in, in the trial, to you? It's, I don't know. I, well, I said I don't care. Because whatever happens to me would not prevent what must happen in Nigeria. It won't stop it. And you're ready for anything? For what? And you're ready for any eventuality? Oh, yes. I've been ready since I was 22 years old. I'm probably living on borrowed times. <laughs> Wow.
Because no human is immune to pain, there is an innate willingness by Omoyele to consistently endure both physical and emotional hardship for the country he loves. Many would ask why he would leave the comfort he has built for himself in the US and return to Nigeria. What about the millions he's been offered by Nigeria's politicians? His very own Sahara reporters could easily be a spokesperson for the Nigerian government. Maybe a ministerial post would allow him to make some small changes across the nation. But Omoyele isn't built like that. He's faced this juggernaut for over 30 years, but keeps coming back. In a nation where former terrorists are granted government positions and progressive army officers are assassinated, the task of men and women like Shoare often seem insurmountable. But just as Rome fell, as the British Empire collapsed, as change swept across North Africa, as Burkina, Mali, and Guinea have all recently changed their leadership, Omoyele might just live to see the promised land he's always dreamed of. Thank you for having me.